This BYU devotional address with Dr. Todd Parker was given on January 20th, 2015. Good morning. My thanks to those who provided the music this morning. Their music has helped to bring the spirit to this meeting. I'd hope to speak by that spirit today. My late friend, Brother Robert J. Matthews, who taught religion here at BYU, used to say, if I speak by the Spirit and you listen by the Spirit, you'll hear things better than I say them. And I pray that can happen here today. I thought it appropriate to begin with a little poem written by a young man that I think might illustrate what sometimes may happen in parents' attempts to change the behavior of their children. He wrote, my parents told me not to smoke. I don't. Or listen to a naughty joke. I don't. They made it plain I mustn't wink. I don't. Or think about intoxicating drink. I don't. Or chase the women wine and song. I don't. To dance and flirt is very wrong. I don't. I kiss no girls, not even one. Some folks think I have no fun. I don't. <clears throat> <clears throat> Now, you see, this young man's behavior was changed, but not his attitude. What's needed is a change in attitude as well as behavior. So I pose the question, what causes a change in attitude and behavior? President Boyd K. Packer stated, true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than a study of behavior will improve behavior. That is why we stress so forcefully the study of the doctrines of the gospel. The purpose of my presentation today is to explore four points of doctrine as found in the scriptures and the words of the brethren. Principle number one, draw upon the power of the word daily. The prophet Mormon wrote, and now as the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just, yea, it had a more powerful effect on mon upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else which had happened to them, Therefore, Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the virtue of the Word of God. When I taught seminary years ago, I wanted to show the youth the power of the Word that Alma describes. I wanted to show them that if they would make the Word of God as found in the Scriptures a part of their lives, it would change them. I didn't know exactly how to do that, but I tried this way. On the first day of class, I gave them a blank sheet of paper and said to them, be honest in your writing here, I'm not going to look at this. Uh, this is for you only. Write down your honest feelings about religion, about God, Christ, Joseph Smith, First Vision Church, or anything you want. Fold it over, staple it, put your name on the outside and the date, and I'll file it away uh, and save it for you, but I'll give it back to you at the end of the year. For the next nine months, we studied the scriptures every day. We marked them. We noted them. The students were challenged to pray every day, morning and night, on their knees out loud, and read a chapter of scripture each day on their own for nine months. On the last day of class, I gave them a sheet of paper. I don't know if they even remembered doing this at the beginning of the year, and I said, now don't try to impress anybody here, just be honest. Write your feelings about God, the church, Christ, the gospel, or anything you'd like. When they got done, I handed them back their previous papers from the nine months earlier. They opened them up and made a comparison. I hadn't intended to read any of them, but a girl named Julie, came to me with tears in her eyes and said, I want you to see this. Here was her first response. I guess sometimes I wonder if Christ really does live. I don't know for sure, and I've always wondered since I was old enough to think about it. I also wonder if this is the true church or not. Everything we're told to do seems right, but I still have doubts. After nine months of studying the scriptures in seminary, she wrote, I know God lives, and his son Jesus Christ is my brother, and he knows me, and he cares about me. Through prayer, I know he will guide us and show us the right way through his prophets, who I know were called of God. I know he loves each of us in a very special way. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true church, and I know it without a doubt. And it was restored by Joseph Smith, who I know was a true prophet. I counted nine times, she said, I know. That's the power of the word in a young lady's life. I had a similar experience in a fifth period class later in the day. An afternoon class in a hot climate is not always the optimal setting for keeping the students' attention. As a matter of fact, this class was a particular challenge to me as I considered my role in their temporal salvation because they seemed so impossible to reach. I thought the only way I could ever help save them 
would be to wait until they all died and do work for the dead. <clears throat> That, however, was not a viable option, but I gave them the same challenge and I'd given the rest of the classes and continued to teach them. At the end of the year, a young man from that fifth period class named Larry came to me and said, you might want to look at this. Here is his first response. I don't really know there's a God. I only go to church to make my mom and dad happy. I wish I had a testimony, but I don't. Sometimes I feel like I have an important job on earth, but I don't know what it is. I'm always wanting to do something wrong. <clears throat> now, I'm an eyewitness to the always wanting to do something wrong part. <clears throat> Nine months later, he wrote, I know the church is true. I have a testimony of it. I love my big brother and my heavenly father. I know they live. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and I have a testimony of it. I love this church with all my life. Some say they do not know if they would give their life for it, but I know if need be, and my father willed it, I would. That's the power of the word in a young man's life. President Ezra Taft Benson promised, when individual members and families immerse themselves in the scriptures regularly and consistently, other areas of activity automatically will come. Testimonies will increase, commitment will be strengthened, families will be fortified, personal revelation will flow. I add my testimony, there is power in the word that can be drawn upon daily. Principle number two, let the scriptures and the Holy Ghost tell you all things that you should do. In 2 Nephi chapter 32, the prophet Nephi wrote, feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what ye should do, and receive the Holy Ghost. It will show unto you all things what ye should do. I'd like to try to illustrate this principle with a personal experience. Many years ago, an invitation had come to me to leave our home in Utah where I was teaching seminary and moved to Arizona to teach institute in Tucson. My wife and I had prayerfully decided this was the right thing to do. It was a little frightening to leave parents, friends, security, and move to a desert land where we knew no one. We traveled to Tucson to find our new home. Upon our arrival in Tucson, we met with a real estate agent. After days of searching, we could find nothing in our price range that even came close to meeting our family's needs as far as location, uh, neighborhoods, schools, so forth. I wasn't used to this desert landscape. The homes had cactus and rock gardens instead of trees and grass lawns. My faith that this move was the right decision began to waver. We were out of options and out of time. The agent suggested that we pick one or two of the homes we like, re, uh, revisit them, and make a decision. Problem was, I hadn't liked any of them. I was depressed. I was heartsick. I needed help. I couldn't sleep. In the middle of the night in the motel room, I turned to the scriptures for help. I read from several places, including Hebrews chapter 11 about faith. Nothing seemed to help. Then it happened. I was reading Ether chapter 12 in the Book of Mormon about faith. I came to verse 32. I read, and I also remembered that thou hast said, thou hast prepared a house. I stopped. I looked up. The Lord has spoken to my soul. A house was prepared. I didn't know how, where, or what was to happen, but I knew a house was prepared. I didn't say anything to my wife. The next morning, we met the agent and drove to a house out on Bear Trail that my wife reminded or remembered as being a possibility of something that might work. As we drove up on a rock driveway, an enormous reptile dropped off a saguaro cactus right in front of the house and scurried off into the desert. I remember thinking, is this reptile a future playmate for my young children? <clears throat> we surveyed the house. Debbie went inside while I checked over the outside. I noticed the roof shingles were corroded from the leaking swamp cooler. The cedar fence was propped up by tuba force. There was a crack in the foundation. The swimming pool was filled with black algae. I thought, well, this is it. We need to decide. <clears throat> no one was near, so I knelt in prayer. I begged the Lord to let me know if this was the house prepared. As I opened my eyes and rose from my knees, I saw a magazine stuck in a bush. Could the magazine contain direction? I went to the bush opened the magazine. <clears throat> it was a pornographic magazine. I closed the magazine, 
I put it back in the bush, I went into the house and announced to my wife, this is not the house. <clears throat> my wife said, how do you know? I said, well, it's a bush thing, I'll explain later. <laughs> we then returned to the agent's car to check one new listing. En route to the new listing, we passed through a neighborhood that reminded me of our home in Utah. There were sidewalks and grass and lawn, children playing. The street had such a good spirit about it, I asked the agent if there was anything for sale in this area. She said no. We rounded a corner and I saw a house with a for sale sign. I asked, what about this one? She said, I have no idea, it's not listed. We copied down the number and made a call. The agent asked the owner why it wasn't listed. She said, well, they were planning to sell, but the home wasn't ready to show, but for some reason, her agent had come early that morning and posted the for sale sign. Our agent asked if we could come see it. She agreed. After we pulled into the driveway and got out of the car, I said to my wife, this is the house. I know it. I couldn't be any more sure than Moses in the burning bush. <clears throat> she looked at me and said, this bush thing again. <clears throat> we loved the house. Through the agent, we made an offer. We turn returned to the motel to wait for the agent's call. I was sitting by the swimming pool at the motel. She finally called and told us they'd accepted our offer. I was ecstatic. I said I wanted to take pictures of the home to show our children, but I had no idea of the address of the property. I asked if she could give it to me, and she said, do you have something to write on? I did, and she gave it to me. The address was 1509 South Burning Tree Avenue. <clears throat> I said, burning tree as in burning bush? She said, yes, I about fell in the pool. <clears throat> a house had been prepared. The Lord had spoken to my soul through Ether chapter 12, verse 32. Elder Dallin H. Oaks said, the idea that scripture reading can lead to inspiration and revelation opens the door to the truth that a scripture is not limited to what it meant when it was written, but may also include what that scripture means to a reader today. Even more, scripture reading may also lead to current revelation on whatever else the Lord wishes to communicate to the reader at that time. We do not overstate the point when we say that the scriptures can be a Urim and Thummim to assist each of us to receive personal revelation. I add my testimony that through the words of scripture and the Holy Ghost, as Nephi said, you can be told and shown all things you should do. Principle number three, use the scriptures to chase darkness from your light. In the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants we read, and that which doth not edify is not of God and is darkness. That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light. And I say it that you may know <clears throat> the truth that you may chase darkness from among you. Many years ago, I was teaching release time seminary. Life was good. I was married to a wonderful woman. We had been blessed with four small children. I was blessed to study the scriptures and teach from them every day. I came home from school one day to discover we were expecting child number five. There was good news and bad news. The good news was the blessing of another child. The bad news was my wife got extremely ill during pregnancies. I knew it was going to be a rough road ahead. It seemed that everything that could go wrong did go wrong during the first three months of Debbie's pregnancy. The list included <clears throat> Debbie was sick with morning sickness. She was in bed for over four weeks and couldn't even sit up. I took a leave of absence from teaching seminary to get my doctoral degree. I was a full-time graduate student with 15 credit hours. I was attempting to fill the role of mother while Debbie was ill. This included house cleaning, laundry, fixing meals, tending kids, running errands, and nursemaid duties. The dishwasher broke. I had no money to fix it or to repair it. Uh, the dishes were done by hand. <clears throat> Jana got an ear infection. She couldn't hear me. I had to take her to the doctor. I had to farm out the two youngest girls, uh, ages two and four, during the day for different ward members to ten. Because of all the turmoil, I was up five to six times each night helping Debbie and consoling the children. Jeremy, then age six, was throwing rocks and an icicle on the front of the house and, and threw a rock through the large preacher window in the living room. 
Jeremy also was chasing Jen and bumped a shelf of figurines. Uh, they crashed to the floor. My wife said, what was that? I said, oh, nothing, dear. <clears throat> uh, the pile of pieces remained in a box for weeks, awaiting the day where I'd have time to glue them back together, uh, which never happened. Uh, <clears throat> Julie, age two, became ill. I took her to the doctor. I had to take Debbie to the hospital several times for intravenous hydration. With all the vomiting, she got dehydrated regularly. I was always at least 500 pages behind in my reading. I was supposed to be doing a literature search for my dissertation. I was serving in as elders quorum president. Many hours of service were required. Other things happened. Wind came up and blew the screen door right off the front of our house. It was lying out in the driveway. I was in an education class where I had to practice giving individualized intelligence tests. Uh, I tested most of the kids in the neighborhood. I began to doubt my own intelligence. <clears throat> The straw that broke the camel's back, I think, was our scruffy little mongrel dog named Fluffy began her breeding cycle. <laughs> we had no fence. It seemed as if we had male dog visitors from everywhere, all enamored with Fluffy. <clears throat> I was at an all-time low. When you're at the bottom, there's no more bottom. I was drowning, being pulled down by an overwhelming whirlpool of duties that I couldn't keep up with. And in the process, I hadn't opened a book of scripture in over four weeks. Prior to all of this, I'd committed myself to teach an adult evening class in the Book of Mormon. It was too much. I felt I couldn't do it, but I was committed. So the night before the class was to begin, I found myself preparing during the only quiet time available, between midnight and 2 a.m. After about an hour of study, I suddenly stopped. Something was different, very different. It took a few moments for me to realize what was happening. Then it came to me like a revelation from heaven. For the first time in four weeks, I wasn't depressed. It was also the first time in four weeks I had immersed myself in scripture study. Because of the tailspin of life I'd found myself in, I felt I had no time to study the scriptures. I was barely surviving day to day. It seemed like it was impossible to allot any time for scripture study. I submit to you that the following words of President Spencer W. Kimball are true. There are blessings that come from immersing ourselves in the scriptures. The distance narrows between ourselves and our Father in heaven. Our spirituality shines brighter. We love more intensely those whom we should love. It's much easier to follow counsel. The lessons of life are learned more readily and surely. I witnessed the blessing of immersing myself in the scriptures. I testify that the light from the Book of Mormon helped chase darkness from me. Now, I acknowledge that Scripture study alone can't resolve all despair and depression, but I do know that when I was finally compelled to act and not be acted upon, it was the keystone, the Book of Mormon, that led me back to the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Principle number four. During scripture study, search for types of Christ. The prophet Nephi said, Behold, my soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. And all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto man are the typifying of him. I know his statement to be true. When we can grasp the idea that Christ is the master teacher, the universe is his classroom, and the curriculum is the atonement, we will never read the scriptures the same again. I believe you can find types in events, travels, topography, seasons, people, names, and so forth. For example, the Bible dictionary under the Pauline epistles for the book of Hebrews states, that the journeys of Israel typify our journey toward eternal life. Israel left Canaan, went to Egypt, fell into bondage. They were led from bondage by Moses, were purified in the desert, then returned to their home to Canaan. Likewise, we leave God's presence, enter a fallen celestial world, and we are delivered from spiritual bondage by Jesus, pass through a purifying terrestrial millennium, and return to God's celestial presence. Let's look at Moses as a type or a symbol of Christ and compare the two deliverers. Moses was Israel's physical deliverer. Jesus is our spiritual deliverer. Moses' first plague was getting Israel out of Egypt. Uh, getting Israel out of Egypt was turning water to blood. Jesus' first miracle in his ministry was turning water to wine. Moses' last plague was the death of the firstborn. Jesus' last miracle was the resurrection of the firstborn. How did Moses free Israel from Egyptian bondage? He had the Israelites take a lamb, male and blemish, firstborn, no broken bones, and sacrifice this lamb by shedding its blood. The Israelites then put the blood of the lamb on the lintels and the two side posts of the doors. 
When they did that, the destroyer passed over them. The blood saved them, the blood of the lamb saved them from physical death. In our lives, we have to accept the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, and symbolically put the blood of his atonement on the door frames of our lives. The blood of the lamb of God will save us from spiritual death. Now those lambs used for sacrifice had to be firstborn. I don't know if you've thought or considered Jesus' birth in the light of his being the Lamb of God. To whom did the angels go to announce the birth of the Lamb of God? Specific shepherds were assigned to tend the flocks of sheep to be used in temple sacrifice. Only a certified firstborn lamb could be used. The shepherds were to be eyewitnesses that the lambs were firstborn. So when the Lamb of God was born, where did the angels go? To the shepherds. Why? Because that was their job, to witness the birth of the firstborn lambs. Moses tells us in the book of Leviticus, chapter 1, that the lambs to be used for sacrifice were to be slain on the north side of the altar. So where do you suppose Jesus, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed? The crucifixion was just north of the temple altar in Jerusalem at a place called Golgotha. The Lamb of God was sacrificed north of the temple altar. All things testify of Christ. After Israel left Egypt, Egyptian bondage, they went into the borders of the Red Sea. In the movie, The Ten Commandments, Yul Brynner plays the part of Pharaoh and says, Moses, God, is a, pure, is a poor general. He leaves them no retreat. Well, not really. Moses went there on purpose. Why? Because they had to go through the Red Sea. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that Israel passed through the Red Sea was a symbol of baptism by water and a baptism by fire. Israel was saved by water. That's why there had to be a wall of water on each side. Israel was baptized by immersion in the Red Sea. The fire held the Egyptians back. Hence, Israel was also saved by fire. It's the same with each of us. We need to be saved through a baptism of water and a baptism of fire. Now, when Israel got to the borders of the Red Sea, the pillar of fire came around behind them. There was first a separation of light and darkness. It was light to the Israelites going through the Red Sea, but it was darkness to the Egyptians. What did God do on the first day of creation? He separated the light from the darkness. What did God then do on the second day of creation? He separated the waters from the waters. What did Moses do? He separated the waters from the waters, and Israel went through on dry ground. They got into the wilderness. The wilderness is a symbol of purification. They were there 40 years. When we get into the millennium, we'll have a 1,000 years of purification. What did they eat while in the wilderness? They ate manna. What is manna? It's bread from heaven. And who is Jesus? He's the bread of life. And where did he come from? Heaven. And where was he born? He was born in Bethlehem. And what does Bethlehem? mean? Bethlehem means house of bread. By chance, I don't think so. <laughs> what did they drink? They drank water. Who is the living water? It is Jesus. Where did they get the water? From a rock. Who is the rock? The rock is Christ. By chance, I don't think so. When Israel went into the promised land, they went through the Jordan River. Why go through a river? You have to be born again. Who led them through the river? It was Joshua. Joshua is the Hebrew for the Greek word Jesus. It was Jesus who caused them to be born again and led them through the Jordan River back to the home and the land of their fathers. They crossed the river at Beth Abra, the same place where Jesus would later be baptized. That section of the Jordan River is the lowest body of fresh water on earth. Elder Nelson taught that Jesus' baptism at Beth Abra symbolized his descending below all things. All things testify of Christ. Consider names, simple names like Joseph Smith. Joseph in Hebrew is Yosef. Yosef means may God add sons. A smith is someone who forges or fashions or beats something out of raw material. So if you're God and you want to establish a kingdom out of raw material and then add sons to it, how do you describe that? Joseph Smith. What does Hiram mean? Hiram means my brother is exalted by chance. I don't think so. <clears throat> Consider the seasons. When was Joseph born? Joseph was born at winter solstice when light is coming into the world. What was the sign to the Nephites when Jesus was born? It was three days of light. When was Joseph killed? Joseph was killed at summer solstice when light is going out of the world. What was the sign to the Nephites at Jesus' death? It was three days of darkness. All things testify of Christ. Moses chapter 6, verse 63 states, All things bear record of Christ, things in the heaven above, on the earth, in the earth, and under the earth. The sun itself is a type of Christ. It comes from the east. Christ will also come from the east. The sun gives light and life to all things. Its heat can also consume all things. Those who live in Arizona understand that. <clears throat> it does both. The light of Christ gives life to all things. Christ's glory will also consume the wicked at his second coming. People whose lives are filled with darkness will be destroyed by the light. 
People whose lives are full of light will be saved by that light as if by fire, to use Nephi's words. Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, states that the earth abideth the law of the celestial kingdom. Well, what does the earth do? The earth revolves around the sun, S-U-N. What should we do if we're to abide the law of the celestial kingdom? Our lives should also revolve around the sun, the S-O-N. The universe was designed to testify of Christ. Consider hibernation. Every creature, every squirrel, every insect, snake, bear that hibernates and lies dormant during the winter appears to be dead. Each one that comes alive again in the spring testifies of Christ and his resurrection. Every tree, every plant, every leaf that becomes green each spring testifies of Christ. Do you think it was by chance that all these things come to life after appearing to be dead at the same time of the year when Jesus came to life again? I don't think so. All things testify of Christ. Now, why do you go to bed at night? Maybe the wrong group to ask this question, but why do most, <clears throat> why do most people go to bed at night? Because they're tired? No. You symbolically die every night. Why do you get up in the morning? To go to school? No. You symbolically resurrect every morning. Have you ever noticed your roommates when they're sleeping? They look dead. <clears throat> <laughs> Arising from sleep every morning is a symbol that we are so close to that we don't even recognize that we symbolically resurrect every morning. Now, those of you that have roommates that sleep past noon now know why we have to have the morning and afternoon of the first resurrection. But <laughs> no, that, no that, that's a joke. <clears throat> <All right. clears throat> but it is no joke that all things testify of Christ. And I add my testimony that's true. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to issue a challenge. One, <clears throat> one last heartfelt plea. 42 years ago, I made a terrible mistake. I was a student at a nearby university. On this very day, January 20th, at this very hour, I was standing by my mother's hospital bed. She was dying. She was in a coma in an intensive care unit following complications from surgery. I was holding her hand and praying she would regain consciousness. I longed to tell her that I loved her. I'd been prompted by the Spirit several times before her surgery to do so, but I had resisted the prompting. I'd reflected on the last time I'd said those words to her. To my best re recollection, it was in third grade. I'd written a little poem of all the mothers, kind and true. You're the best, and I love you. My mother died 42 years ago tomorrow, on January 21st, 1973. I lost a great opportunity as a result of resisting a prompting of the Spirit. So how does that apply to you here today? My hope is that each one of you today has felt a prompting of the Spirit hopefully a prompting to improve your life through scripture study. My prayer is that you will respond to that prompting of the Spirit and not resist it. I pray that you will not carry with you a regret of resisting a spiritual prompting like I have all these years. My challenge to you is study the scriptures daily. Draw upon the word daily. Let the words of Christ tell you all things that you should do and drive darkness from your life. May you always remember that all things testify of Christ. I pray that your consequent understanding of true doctrine will change both your attitudes and your behavior. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This BYU devotional address with Dr. Todd Parker was given on January 20th, 2015.